Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us for another one of our Industry Insights webinars. We're going to be talking about lighting today, uplighting and path lighting specifically, and we're going to give you some valuable tools and knowledge to help you with your lighting business or your lighting designs. With that being said, I'd like to introduce the presenters that we have for you on the call today. Ryan Williams is the Director of Marketing for FX Luminaire and has been with the company for 10 years. There he is, he just popped up on the screen. Wave at the audience. Hey everybody. Thanks Ryan. We also have Jordan Telford on the call. He's a sales manager covering Western Canada, Oregon and Washington and he's been with the company for five years. So if you're in that territory and you didn't know who your, who your sales manager was, this is your guy. Now, take down his email if you wanted to get a hold of him later on. And if you happen to be in the Pennsylvania, Maryland, or Delaware market, Tony Italia is joining us on the call today. He's a sales manager as well with Hunter Industries for 11 years. So we have some OG guys from the FX Luminaire market here on the call to answer some questions and give some insights on lighting design. Now, if you're in those markets, make sure you take down Tony's email. If you don't know who your sales manager is or your spec manager, please reach out to me, take down my email, and I will get you in touch with your sales manager so that if you have any questions to follow up from this webinar, or you just wanna reach out to them and say hi, get to know them a little bit, I can get that information for you. So without further ado, we're gonna jump into the presentation. We're gonna be talking about design fundamentals, levels of light, uplighting techniques, tips for uplighting, path lighting, uh, path light fixture selection and understanding of what those are, path light spacing and alignment. This is a huge thing for aesthetics and functionality. Then at the end of all that, we're gonna have a t an opportunity for live questions and answers. So stay tuned for that. Without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Jordan to kick it off with the design fundamentals. Jordan, take it away. Thanks everybody for joining us today. I really appreciate you all taking the time out of your busy schedules to uh, to to further your knowledge about landscape lighting. Um, we we here at Hunter really appreciate the the partnership that we have with you all, and um, and we uh, we welcome you here today. So I want to talk a little bit about before we jump in specifically to uplighting and the techniques of uplighting which is the topic that, that we're gonna be discussing, I wanted to lay a little bit of foundation for that. So we're gonna talk about some design fundamentals to understand so that when I dive into the uplighting, it makes a little more sense. So the first thing is that if we're talking about a yard, the first step whenever we go to make any kind of landscape design um, for landscape lighting is determining our, our vantage points. So these are these are where are we going to be viewing the lights from? And that's really important because it has to do with glare shielding, has to do with how many lights we use, are the lights behind a tree, on the side of the tree, on the front of the tree? Those all come into play when we talk about starting from our vantage points or where can we view the yard from. After we've determined our vantage points, the next thing we need to do is identify our focal points. These are going to be the most important parts of our landscape. So these are going to be the things that we want to see. They're going to be they're going to be what what we want to to attract your eye first. Um, and and this will also come into play when we talk about how to light up a tree. How you light up determines whether it will be a focal point or whether it might be a transitional lighting or in the foreground. So. The next concept that I want everybody to understand is transitional areas. So these are gonna be the areas that take place between the focal points. So if we have these, these, these focal points that you see on the screen with the red X's, anything that kind of blends the light so that it carries your eye from focal fo point to focal point, these are our transition areas. And then the last thing is our foreground. So this is gonna be what we see prior to getting to our focal points. And it will also come into play when we talk about how to light up a tree or how many lights or where to place those lights. We need to understand where our focal points are, where our transitional areas, where our foreground is, and where we're gonna view the yard from. 
the next topic I want to make sure to go over with you guys before we jump into into specifically uplighting is the levels of light. So when I'm when we're working on a design, we, we're going to be working with three levels of light. So the first level of light is going to be our soft lighting. These are going to be our you our low level lighting. So this is going to be our path lighting, down lighting, maybe our wall washes, our task lighting. So if you take a look at the picture off to the right, you can see this is a great blend of of you know you can see our focal point how it's it's back there in the back with the sculpture and that's brighter than everything else. And then your low level lighting is the down lighting that's happening in the foreground. The next level of light is our medium level of light. We're gonna use our medium level of light for our transitions. And so if you have back to that, that design section that I did just now, our X's were our focal points. And then that, that yellow, kind of hazy overlay on that map, those are our those are our transition. That's what's going to bring your eye into the focal point. It's what's going to help you avoid dark sp dark spots in your design and it's going to help you to to transition between between focal points. And it's what gives you visual direction. It it's what makes the lighting kind of pleasing to the eye and helps you to see the full image of it. And then last when we talk about a level of, of light is our bright light. So our bright lights are gonna be our architectural features, our trees, could be statues, could be fountains. These are gonna be the most important things or the things that we want you to be able to see over everything else in the landscape. We want them to stand out. So now we're gonna transition over into uplighting specifically. So there are multiple different ways to, to do uplighting. So the first one is backlighting. So when you talk about backlighting a tree, what you're doing is creating a silhouette of the tree in front. This is, a, this is gonna make a level one lighting. So when we talk about backlighting and our levels of light, we want our backlighting to be in the foreground. We want it to be something that's not going to be bright. It's not really going to draw your eye in. It's going to help to fill out the fill out the image. If we move those those fixtures to the side of the tree, what we're doing is called side lighting. And we're going to use side lighting when we talk about our transitional lighting. So this is where we're trying to blend between a focal point And then the last one is our front lighting. So when you take a light and you move it to the front of the tree, be it one light or three light to capture the canopy, you what you're doing is you're turning it into a focal point. It immediately is going to be what you see the brightest. It's going to be what's the most obvious in the landscape. Another concept that I want to discuss with you guys today is making sure that we're integrating down lighting with our up lighting. So when you integrate downlighting and uplighting, you get a much more complete view of the tree and as well as what's on the ground. So when you downlight and uplight, your light source is concealed by the uplight beam. And, and so, you know, one big concern with just downlighting is, is that you're going to get glare and you're going to see where that light comes from. When you uplight it, you actually remove where that light comes from because it gets blended in with all of the uplight. And it also gives you a much more balanced and natural looking light. This is kind of like a layout of what we're talking about, having these focal points. So anything, any tree with a three next to it would be our level three lighting. And then you can see how we have our level two lighting that's creating transitional points between our focal points. And then our level one lighting would be utilizing backlighting in order to, to still provide light, but make sure that those trees aren't turning into a focal point and taking away from, from the focal points that are there. So this is a great example of what we're talking about you can see that the tree in the middle of the image is is definitely the focal point it's what's standing out from the rest of the image 
Um, and you can also see that we have focal points on the right and left hand side with those smaller trees that are really bright. They're brighter than the rest of it. But what you're seeing in the in the foreground here is that the tree that's taller on your left hand side of your screen that's sticking up is actually backlit. So while it is lit and it is providing some light to the image, that lighting is is very subdued because of the placement of the tree or the placement of the light on the tree. And then what you're seeing in the in the in between the focal points is side lighting, which is creating a much softer light as you transition between focal point to focal point. This makes sure that we don't we don't draw your eye into those those transitional places, or we don't draw draw your eye into um, away from the focal points that we want you to see in the image. Another question that we often get when we're talking about uplighting is, how many lights do you need per tree? And the the answer to the question is is well, it kind of depends on the size of the tree. So, so this is a great guide for how many uplights we need on a tree. If we're talking about a small tree with a five foot or less canopy, we can typically get away with a single fixture in the front of it. When we get up to a medium sized tree, we use a technique called cross lighting, which is where you place two fixtures on either side of the tree and the right hand side fixture takes care of the left hand side of the tree and the left hand fixture takes care of the right hand side of the tree. And so what that does is it allows the canopy to appear more full and for you to get more light. It keeps you from just kind of having a beam that runs up the middle of the tree. And then if your canopy is larger than 15 feet, you should definitely consider going to three fixtures, which will help capture the entire canopy and give you a very full looking tree. Hey, Jordan. Yeah. One thing I wanted to chime in on is beam spread. So when you talk about number of fixtures per tree, and I don't know if you're going to get to that, but just changing the beam spread from like a 35 to a 60 sometimes can really encompass left to right on a shorter, wider tree. And I see people making a big mistake when they get the out of the box standard spotlight 35 degree and they'll put it right in the middle of a wider tree when really just a switch of a lamp or a, or a spread lens can give you a really good effect. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, beam spread is is really important when it comes to uh to your your fixture selection and and um and fixture shape and 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 those and what what fixture you choose for what for what piece of plant material. Thanks, Tony. So this is a great image of of the concept that we're talking about. Here we have a really wide canopy, so there's actually two lights on this tree. Um, if you look in the bushes or just behind the hedge here, you'll be able to see there's 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 two fixtures there, and they're both kind of tilted in, pointing towards the opposite side of the tree. The other thing that you can see here is the shadowing effect that's being created across this walkway. This is created by integrating downlighting and uplighting into the same tree. I think it's also important to note that you don't really see the downlighting that's up inside of this canopy because of the because of the uplighting. So the uplighting will actually help to hide the downlighting, but it gives you this really cool shadowing effect across across the pathway. So I want to talk about a few tips for uplighting. So some 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 little little things that that you should definitely consider. So the first thing is is that when we talk about uplighting, we're not talking about just your 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 standard bullet light or your standard uplight. We're also talking about your in-gray lights, your well lights, or it could be a wash light. So, you know, when when I say the term uplighting, I don't I don't want you to just think of an uplight. I want you to think of uh, other fixtures that we use, anything that's pointing up with your lighting. Um, the other the other important tips or important things for you to know are uh, using screening. So screening is a technique that you use. Uh, and it was on the last image as well. It's where when we put an uplight, if we're putting it by the tree or we're putting it by a piece of artwork or up into a structure or or any of those applications, we want to make sure that we have something that's hiding the glare from us. And that goes back to the very first slide when we talk about vantage points. It's really important that when you look out into the landscape, you're seeing the light, not the light source. So we want to try and try and 
um, limit the number of glare spots that we see or limit the amount of that we can actually see where the physical light is coming from. And we do that using using screening by putting something in front of it that will create that will keep the light from being visible. Uh, it could be a rock or a plant or it could, you know, if we're talking about downlighting, sometimes it's mounting it to the back side of a branch versus the front side of a branch. Um, it, it could be um, it could be a piece of artwork that you want to create kind of a silhouette similar to what we're seeing on the screen now. It's also important that we use things like hex baffles. So hex baffles are installed over the actual LED source and in between the glass lens and the LED source. And what they do is they cut down your ability to see the light without looking directly into it. So it works kind of as a it works as a, a glare shielding. So in the case that you can't get you can't get like perfectly screened, you can use a hex baffle to cut down on the the light you see. The other big thing that's important or a big mistake that I see is leaving extra wire on your fixtures. So a lot of times in the field, we see people who cut their wires down to the exact size and hook them up. The problem with doing this is, is as that tree grows, you may need to move that light or even doing a night adjustment, you may need to move that light. You may get out there and just find that it doesn't quite look right where it is. If you haven't provided yourself enough extra wire, you don't have the opportunity to to, to move that. This also comes into play if you if you have to do any kind of replacement light, you know, if the mailman's backing out of the driveway and runs over the light, you need that extra wire to make sure that you can you can get the, the fixture up out of the way to do any kind of repairs. And so that's a, another big pitfall that I see when I'm out in the field working with guys. The next thing I wanna make sure to talk about is is your beam angle and and Tony Tony alluded to this a little bit earlier that there are different beam angles with each with each fixture and whether that's using our integrated series where you can use a beam angle spread lens and just change it at the fixture or whether you're using one of our drop-in LED lamps that have a fixed beam angle it's really important that you're matching your beam angle to what you're lighting up so if I'm lighting up something very narrow and tall, up here in Washington, we have a lot of evergreen trees and we end up using a very narrow or a spot on, on pine trees that have been limbed up or, or on cedar trees that have been limbed up. So it's really important that you're, you're matching your proper beam angle to the plant material that you're lighting up. And sometimes that's done with multiple fixtures and sometimes that's done by using a different lens or a different fixture whether it's going to a wash light for a small maple tree or whether it's or whether it's snapping in a 60 degree lens to make to capture more of the canopy it's important that we understand that there's different options when it comes to beam spread and making sure that we are we're we're utilizing all the options that are there based on the tree that you that you've chosen to plant and it, i think it's important to note that as we narrow the beam spread, we're going to increase the lumen count in a smaller area. We're not increase the lumen count. The lumen count stays the same, but it's now narrowed into a smaller area. So you're going to tend to, the, the light can appear almost more powerful. So you need to make sure that you're using the proper beam spread. And, and in some cases, if you're going more narrow, lowering, lowering your lumen count or getting a less bright fixture will help, will help cut down on, on ending up with a really, really bright center beam. All right, thanks, Jordan. Uh, Jordan covered design fundamentals, levels of light, uplighting techniques, and tips for uplighting in general. We're gonna pass it over to Ryan Williams, who is now going to cover path light. He's gonna start with path lighting fixtures, path lighting spacing and alignment, and then after that, we're gonna go into our Q&A session. Ryan, take it away. Sure, thanks, Greg. So, uh, so a couple of thoughts, generally speaking, on path lighting, and that is there, there are many people who have a love-hate relationship with path lights. Uh, path, you, you can't hide the fact that they are the, the second most popular style of lighting fixtures that are sold here in North America. And so uh, they, because they are so popular, you have a core group of people who just use them all the time. And then you have others who say, you know what, I want to avoid path lights as much as I can. Now, uh, one of the, the primary reasons for today is not only just to kind of review path lighting in general, 
but also just to kind of give you a quick a few quick tips and, and maybe some best practices uh, for those who might want to use or get into using them a little bit more in the future. Okay, so let's uh, let's chat about the different types of path lighting that you see. So when we say, okay, well, I've got a, a path light here, really there, there's three types of, of path lights that we're talking about. And, and they have kind of different names. Uh, one of which is an area light. So an area light, at least in the landscape market, often refers to a fixture that has 360 degrees worth of coverage. Now this, this us usually ends up being one of those classic uh, a hat on a stem or, or riser kind of concept. And this is the, the where you find the, the bulk of the path lights. Um, ben the benefit of, uh, of these types of lights is, is really that it has that 360 degree coverage. You can light up the path in general as well as using some backlighting for more of the, the landscape that is surrounding the area. It generally becomes a little bit softer because you have fewer transitions worth of light. And like I said, it's the most popular style that comes with that more traditional style and therefore homeowners kind of expect to see it. Um, you do want to be careful when you use the term area light when you're talking to your commercial lighting friends because uh, area light does tend to refer to uh, larger lights for uh, that are up on poles such as parking lighting or, or park, parking lot lighting and, and so in that case but in, in our little landscape world um, it tends to mean something different and that's kind of what we, we refer to that as the, the second category is more of a directional path light so in this case when i want the light to go in a specific place but i still need to have the fixture installed off of that path then a directional path light is the best way to go in that case, we have zero backlighting, and, and that might be, be for several reasons. Number one, we need to have maybe less light, let, uh, light trespass coming onto a, a neighboring property. Uh, number two, the landscape back there might not be that nice looking, so we wanted to bring more attention to the path. Uh, thirdly, if we want to uh, just increase the, the safety factor uh, of uh, getting more light onto the path, a, uh, a directional path light is going to be the best option for that. Now, lastly, the third one is a is a marker light. So a marker light generally follows the structure or the same, same reasons for using an area light, right? We still have that 360 degree coverage, but, uh, but what we call the, the discomfort glare is so, so low that it makes it an appealing fixture where it becomes uh, more of an artistic piece at night rather than just a, 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 a general fixture. Now, um, marker lights generally break our common rule that we have in the lighting world, right? Which is, we, want, we don't wanna see the source of the light, we just wanna see the effect of the light. And, that, and that's the number one thing that, that breaks that rule is, is marker lights. But, but it, the reason we can get away with that with marker lights is because what I said, that discomfort glare is so low that it makes it appealing. And in this example, we call this the PM. This, this fixture has a solid acrylic, acrylic lens in there and that, that diffuses the light so much that allows us to get the right amount of illuminance on the ground, um, but yet make it a, a soft and easy on the eyes here. Now, there is a fourth category that you'll find for, for path lights and that is a bollard. That's another word you might hear. Now, now, bollards, generally speaking, don't fit one of the, within one of these specific categories, area, directional marker, because it could be one of the three. Uh, we just typically find bollards being a little bit taller uh, than normal classic landscape lighting path lights. And so, um, but that's just another term that you might hear is, is bollard. Now, now, when we talk about path lighting, or path lights, it's really two different conversations. Path lights are the three categories that we just mentioned. Path lighting is, is putting that light on the paths, and we can do that in, in a number of different ways, and that does not have to be focused on path lights themselves. Now, in the top left corner here, we have that classic use, where we're, we are path lighting, we have lights that are next to a path, we're illuminating the path itself. In this case, this is a, a, a more of a directional path light than anything else. But um, again, there are other ways to talk about. Number, number two, shall we say, is the uh, putting lights on the hardscape or architecture that happens to be next to the path light. This is, uh, this is not always an easy case, depending on if the, the hardscape or architecture is already built. 
it can be quite a, a fine art on uh, learning how to install on these things after the fact, although I know there are many people who can do that very, very well. So always remember that path lights don't have to be path, path lighting doesn't have to be path lights specifically. I, another category is ground wash. So if I want to take an in-grade fixture and spread the light across the path, then the ground wash option is a, a fantastic option for you. Uh, you just, in this case, you definitely want to make sure that uh, there aren't a lot of changes in elevation uh, because that light source is direct, di directly facing outward. And so when you have hills and, uh, and general changes of elevation, this might not be the ideal scenario. And, and lastly, well, again, when we're trying to light up the path, we've got a, a down lighting, as Jordan talked about, is always a fantastic option. Um, now, there, there is a fifth category that I did not bring up, and that is uh, what I tend to call reflective light. Okay, so in the case where you would like to put up lights on a tree, and that tree happens to be right next to the path, you will often find a lot of reflective light that, that jumps off of the tree and back on the path itself. And so it's kind of like a, a nice little trick of the eye to be able to light up the path without actually using path lights or, or any type of light specifically on the path. Uh, quick questions for my friends uh, Jordan and, and Tony here. I mean, what are what are your general thoughts here on on using path lights um, or, or using path lighting without the path lights? What are your thoughts? Any any experience or thoughts here? Ryan, one thing I always uh, get questioned on is which way would I go? You know, what would be the best fixture or product for a specific job? And I usually pose a quick question is how they are going to be used and what's the traffic pattern. Mm -hmm. So it often contractor goes back to the homeowner and a few lifestyle questions. And next thing you know, path lights aren't the option or classic use style because they have dogs or they have kids with soccer balls out there. Yeah. And we know what they look like after they've been played with for a while. So we'll go with the reflective lighting or a combination of ground wash, down lighting and reflective. So there's, there's so many different ways to do it and blending is what I find works the best. And what do you mean by blending? Is that just using multiple categories here? Yeah, I'd say a combination uh, because you're hitting multiple facets and you create depth that way. And um, you know, it doesn't have to cost more because instead of putting eight path lights, you may be using five, but maybe putting a couple of reflective ground wash lights to get some of the hard to reach areas or high traffic. Perfect. Jordan, any thoughts here from your experience? What's your yeah, in my experience, I'm always going to I'm going to always kind of lean towards a downlight or a hardscape architecture application. Um, I like to utilize the trees that are, are near a pathway, either using some sort of reflective lighting or downlighting um, for a lot of the same reasons that, that Tony is referring to, whether it be dogs, kids, it's along a driveway. You know, we've replaced a lot of path lights that have been run over and um those those types of things so so i think utilizing the other features in the landscape the only other thing that that maybe would be a little bit later is is in the classic use picture here it's i, I really like the way that they move the path light off of the path it doesn't necessarily need to be hovering right over the top of the path in order to be considered a path light um, you know, it, it gives it something of interest to light up and, and provides more of, of an opportunity for, for utilizing the overall lighting scene versus, hey, just a, just a spot of light on the concrete. Perfect. That's a, that's a fantastic thought. If you guys can both stick on here, I got some more questions for you. And that is specifically on spacing and alignment. Okay. So now I can go into the, the technicality of, of path light spacing. But I'm wondering first if we can give your uh, your general rule of thumb thoughts here. Like when we talk about path light spacing, what's your what's your let's start with Tony here. What's your what's your go to rule of thumb for this? Uh, again, first question is, uh, can you stagger them or do you have to go in a line? Uh, sometimes there's turf on one side or there's a, a structure that they just can't get under. So they're limited to one side. And then the second question is, how high are we going to make these things? Are they going to be 18 inch risers? 12 inch risers because that's going to have a lot to do with how they throw and the last question if especially if it's a uh, you know not a site visit is what are we lighting up surface wise if it's a really light color concrete if it's a dark paver if it's mulch 
um, that's going to change my ideas as well. And usually by the time I kind of formulate those three, um, we'll go with a standard, you know, eight to 12 feet distance. Uh, if it's an 18 inch, if it's 12 inch, maybe we'll go a little closer. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of the contractor's call in the end, but it's a tough question unless you're there and you're looking at the entire picture. All right, perfect. So, so Jordan, help me out here. Like um, Tony mentioned, 12 inch riser, 18 inch riser, maybe even 24. Uh, do you make that decision first, or what are your thoughts there? Um, typically, I want to, if at all possible, I want to put myself in the space to make that decision. Um, you know, how tall your path light is isn't. It's it it definitely depends on how you know it definitely determines how far the light's gonna throw and how what the spacing is apart and 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 that's definitely an important piece of it. But if it's along a staircase or maybe I don't have access to, um, like I don't have I don't have enough of a side you know along the side of the staircase to get a path light in there so that we can have multiple. Sometimes I need to go to a taller path light to catch you know the third stair riser or whatever it may be, um, and then also. It, it depends on what plant material is going to be surrounding it and how it's going to blend into the landscape. If I wanted to back to that idea of making sure that it's lighting up something of interest, not just the path, it, how tall is what I'm lighting up? Is it going to be ground cover? Is it going to be a rock? Do I need to get it above that? Um, and so that plays a big point. And then, and then the overall um, slope of the land makes a big difference. You know, if you have a taller path light, your, your tendency to look up into it is going to be greater. And so you need to you know, take that into consideration. If you're going to an 18 or 24 inch path light at the top of a stair, you're probably going to be able to see up into that. So that's, that's another really important thing. And to tag on to what Tony said is um, it's, it's, and, and Tony alluded to it earlier is how do you use the space? You know, we, if we've done some, some lighting jobs where, it's it's in resorts or it's a very high use space where safety is of great concern or or maybe it's an an elderly couple who that owns the house that's concerned about their safety getting into the into the house in which case we need to make sure that every inch of the path is lit up but if it's something more that's that's you know you're creating a dramatic effect or it's not a well used path in the evening we can create these pool of lights that just allow you to kind of get from light to light versus the whole path being lit so so how it's being used and and who's using it also becomes a big concern when we talk about path lighting perfect jordan so so both of your answers really kind of show us all why why this path light spacing is a hard decision riser height obviously the higher the riser is the taller the path light becomes right the the farther spread that you can play with and the higher that riser is the farther you can space them apart uh, many people don't realize the um, the hood size. I'm going to say hood or even hat size of the path light also affects the. Uh, well, I'm going to call it the forward or outward throw. Now, it's not always the size that matters. It's it's oftentimes just the the dimensions of that path light. Because you can see here from the image here, the 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 angle at which the light exits the fixture is really dependent on the angle of this um, path light top. If I get a wider top that not only is wider but has a, a sh more shallow angle, then I'm going to go in to get a much farther throw. So I would always recommend choosing some path lights that have that that narrow angle to get the widest throw to be able to use, let's say, the, the least number of path lights and to be able to spread them out as far as that as, as we can. Um, obviously, intensity it uh, plays into a factor as well, but really I want you to focus on the riser height and the dimension or, or design of that, uh, that top assembly more than anything else. Now, from a technical standpoint, what, we really, what we're talking about is, is the amount of light on the ground. We call that illuminance. Now, illuminance is, is really a, a metric that can be measured in either foot candles or lux. That, uh, and the difference between the, between the two is really the, uh, the measurements that we use. In North America, we're, we're used to using th measuring things in feet. And uh, everywhere else in the world, they're, they're measuring things in, in meters. And so foot candles and lux, the difference is really more of a North American term versus a, uh, we'll call it an international term. And a uh, interesting tidbit of information, too, that's why we call the Luxor the Luxor, right, because of lux. So you didn't know that. 
Uh, but but in general, when we when we give you the the photometrics, if you look at the data sheets on all the products, you'll find that you'll find these numbers here in, in terms of number of foot candles. Uh, 0.5 foot candles after two feet, 0.1 foot candles after three feet. Generally speaking, from a commercial standpoint, you'll want to uh, you typically want an average of one foot candle minimum of 0.1. So we so sometimes we want to just almost uh, it's easier just to butt these the two up together here at the 0.1 mark, which in this fixture for an SP happens to be around three feet. So from a commercial application, I'm looking to be around six or seven feet. Uh, obviously, if you do butt these up together at the 0.1, technically that's a minimum of, minimum of 0.2 foot candles, which is a little bit too much. Um, when we're talking about residential spacing, um, I usually take this number and multiply it by three at the 0.1 number. So in this case for the SPA or SP that ends up being at a nine foot spacing. So I think uh, Tony's rule of thumb really was, uh, I think he said anywhere from eight to 12 feet, depending on the fixture. So, um, so say that again, Tony. One more point to add, and this is a, a bit of a saving grace for a lot of manufacturers that make lights too, but especially for us, is um, you know money is a consideration, and we do make one LED, we make three LED. Some of our path lights go all the way up to nine LED in the uh, the modern series. But I, I you know kind of let people know like, hey, if you go with a one and you think that's right, if it's not, you can always upgrade. And if they're going with our retrofit, you've got several options to get the right light. So you you kind of can't go wrong as long as you're really looking into it and you you think about it. There, it, you know, it's, it's not a one and done situation. You can upgrade or downgrade. Perfect, fantastic. Thanks, Tony. So the, the next question is, is that if we got the spacing thing down, understand the, the fixture styles that we're selecting, the general purpose of the path light, really the next question becomes is, okay, how am I installing these things? Am I doing more of the, uh, am I doing a symmetry alignment concept or am I um, mixing it up a little bit? Now I've got, I've got two pictures here and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for some commentary here from Jordan and Tony on uh, their general thoughts. So there's there's two questions here. There's no, there's one when when is symmetry when does symmetry alignment look good? Um, I think we got a great example of when it looks bad. And uh, and lastly, we're gonna talk about the the hidden hidden problem within these these images here. So let's let's start with Tony here. Tony, when when do you like symmetry alignment? So I mean, this is a this is a clear example of uh, you know in the in the eye of the beholder. So you've got symmetry on the left. You've got you know a row of path lights on 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 a uh, a nice hardscape walkway leading to a pergola or some type of arbor. You've got beautiful background. So it's literally leading you to this stage. Whether you're going to hang out there, there might be a fire pit there or something. But it's very contrived. And to some people, they, they might love that. But to others, it just looks very manufactured. It doesn't flow naturally. But on the right side, you've got just touches of light. But you have a lot of depth in the picture. And you've got a neighboring house as well that has uh, apparently a lot of light on it as well. So it's, uh, it's flow. So I mean, they're very radically different photos. Um, you know, To me, I, I love the one on the right. It's just it's very natural and clean. And you see so much depth. Perfect. Now, Jordan, can you tell me the uh, what, what's what's wrong in one of these photos? Well, when I look at when I look at the one on the left, I, I feel like the path guides kind of take your eye away. And back to that whole idea of having levels of light, um, I feel like the path lights to me are are really bright. That's the first thing you see. And is that really the most important piece of the image? Is that really what you're trying to take your your eye to? You have this beautiful backdrop of trees behind it um, in, a, you know, incorporating maybe or, or rather not having all your lighting at the same exact level, creating, you know, a more dramatic scene in the back and then and then lowering the light level in the foreground in order to allow you to see the trees a little bit better behind that path light. So that would be the first thing that I would see that I'm like that I would that I would say, well, maybe maybe not the way I would have I would have done it. And on the right, I would have said that um, I think what Tony is saying is is absolutely right. I like the idea of how how soft and subtle the whole image is and how, you know, even though we have path lights that are that are right there on either side of the path, they don't take away from the rest of the image. I would probably 
have used more fixtures on the tree in the front. So that seems to be the focal point for me in the image. And and you see kind of the center of the trunk is missing and some of the some of the branching material and things are missing. So I might have I might have included an additional one or two uplights to maybe capture more of that of that beautiful tree right in the front of the image. Sounds great. Thanks. So the, the general thought here is, is uh, the common common description on the one on the left, right, is a runway effect. And I, I like how Jordan called that a, a manufactured look because I think that's a great description of of what that ends up being. On the I, the one on the right, it is a beautiful image, a much prettier setting. But what I liked about this is it does have the symmetrical install, not only here in the front of the stairs, but also if you look a little bit farther back in the image, you can you can kind of tell as it angles backward, it still does keep the, the, the symmetrical look. I do like and appreciate the symmetrical look when we have a lower quantity number of fixtures. When the, those two are just by themselves, I think it, it turns out really well. Uh, when you start repeating that pattern, that's when it looks, as Jordan says, manufactured. So the last thing I do want to, to touch on is just if you look at the image on the left, the fixtures are installed in turf. So Tony, what can you tell me about installing path lights or fixtures in general in turf? So that's they took the easy way. Um, they took the, uh, we lost our image, there we go. Uh, it's definitely the easy way. Um, first time lighting people, guys who don't have a lot of experience, uh, they may opt for this, but the maintenance that's gonna require, uh, you know, to do with the turf from string trimming and edging, typically what people do is they're either gonna weed whack around these and start tearing up the lights, bending them over, or they're going to pull them up every time, which I see a lot, and then put them back in loosely, and then they lean after a heavy rain. It's uh, it's a maintenance nightmare that will end up looking horrible. Yep. So just remember just to avoid uh, putting path lights in turf, for sure. Um, here's the here's the uh, the other side of things of installing path lights more at an alternating effect here. Okay, so this is this is the difference here. Um, either Jordan or Tony, who can ch chime in here? What are your thoughts on more of the alternating effect of path lights? What does that do to people who are in the space? I think it provides more of a guide. So where back to having symmetrical path lights, kind of kind of just brings light into the space and just shows you the path this i feel like i feel like um alternating alignment path lights give you more of like a guide they feel more inviting they kind of tell you where to go from place to place um typically speaking you know when i'm working with with contractors on designs we're going to look at using alternating alignment and kind of creating that 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 inviting feeling through it yeah, I mean, I, I want to walk down that path on the right. That just, it's very inviting. I, I want to go down it. It's like step by step to get to the end and see where to go next. The one on the left is, it's more of a postcard image. It's, a, it's almost like an advertisement for lighting, but it's very busy. And you really can't take anything in all at once. Sure, fantastic, fantastic. Um, lastly, just one, we've, I think we've talked about a few of these already. This is uh, this is my last topic for the day, and, and really it's the it's the watch out for um, question. Okay, so so I think Jordan alluded, alluded to it earlier in uh, in terms of changes in elevation, right? So when we when we talk about um, stairs, path lights tend to uh, be difficult with stairs, right? Because if you take a look at those classic area lights as we've described them, that means you're looking up into the fixture, um, th uh, your entire um, motion all the way up the stairs. And so that becomes a very distracting element more than uh, adding to safety as the path lights were designed to do. And going, obviously going down downstairs is much easier. So in these cases, how do we how do we avoid avoid this, uh, Tony? Is this just to use the other areas in terms of lighting or, or what do we do here for changes in elevation? So when we went with the styles of path lighting earlier, we looked we talked about directional. So what we've got here is your traditional style um, top hat uh, on a stem, and we're getting a 360 view coming out of here. Is that really necessary? So we've got the elevation. Uh, it's gonna be great when you're walking up the steps looking down, there's plenty of safety and security, but from this image, um, maybe a directional, because it would kind of cut back on all that glare going to us, 
and really just laying on the spot that you're going to need to see. Uh, I think that's your best option here. Or downlighting if you have the trees above, of course. Perfect. Perfect. Now, Jordan, how do we how do we avoid the the topic of leaning path lights? Because we we've all seen it, we've all experienced it. How how do you avoid that from happening? Well, I think I think some of that is going to depend on where you are in the in the country and what kind of soil that you're working with. So, particularly if you've brought in a lot of soil and you have, you know, you you have just this you know new garden beds or anything like that with this very loose soil. I've seen uh, guys do things like take a take a rebar spike and stick it through the opening in a in a stake and and then stake that so that that provides some stabilization that way. Um, I think the other thing that that it's important to to know is that uh, lighting requires maintenance, and that's part of it. And I think that that's a piece of lighting that often we overlook. We just we put in the lighting and we're like, hey, it looks gorgeous, we love it. But if you're not coming back and cleaning lenses and reaming fixtures and as the tree grows, you know, moving that fixture and and standing back up path lights and restaking them and those those uh, those kind of maintenance things, you know, a, a leaning path light might might very well be inevitable. But with proper maintenance, you can you can put it back to where it should be on a regular basis. Perfect. Thanks. I would also add that there are a number of other accessory mounting options that are that are more robust in those parts of the country where you need something more stable. So so there there are there are um, accessories that are available as well as uh, tricks of the trade like like Jordan mentioned in terms of rebar. Uh, lastly, I would mention I think Jordan mentioned this earlier about ex in general excessive height. Right. It doesn't always need to be as tall as we think. It just the, the goal here is to remember what the illuminance on the ground looks like and feels like rather than what the 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 height or design of the path light might be. Uh, before before I end my topic here on path lights, are there any any other watch out fors that that you would like to add either Jordan or Tony? But I've got to go back to the uh, this just struck me. So years ago, a, a contractor who will remain nameless um, talked about landscape lighting and putting in a beautiful job going there the night that you finish the job tweaking things and then walking away and you know he said if you never go back every year once a year or something just to tweak it it's like buying a brand new car with a beautiful paint job parking it under some trees and never washing it especially on the east coast here and you end up you we all see these cars in parking lots where they're covered with god knows what and it's just, it becomes an eyesore because things aren't right anymore. So you, you definitely have to pay attention. Trees grow around things. And, you know, that's a good analogy. It just, it's, they start falling apart the week after you put them in. You know, you've got to kind of pay attention and tweak things um, as they creep up. Sure. Fantastic. Jordan, any, any, uh, any final, uh, final watch out for us for path lights? Uh, just just to reiterate where you place them along the path is is just so important not not just for for um, aesthetics and making sure that you're you're providing something of interest for them to do more than just the path itself but also for safety you know if you put your path light right along an edge of a path you're somebody's more likely to clip it with their foot or um, you know it's more likely to get broken by by the dog or the light or the ball or whatever else is going on in the in the property so that would be the other one is is where you place the path light in according you know in in relation to the path it's really important perfect perfect thank you so so in gen in general remember with path lights there are a number of different path light styles there are a number of different ways to to light the path itself so so remember there are a lot of uh, tricks of the trade that we talked about a lot of uh, stylistic questions that we resolved as, as well as tr trying to help you um, make or not make some of the mistakes that, that we've made or seen in the past. So with that, Greg, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Ryan. And thank you, Tony and Jordan. Great presentation. Now, there is a few questions that came up that I want to address. And we'll get started. If you guys want to come back on the screen for the Q&A portion of this, we will kick it off. Now, one of the questions that we had was using the hex baffle. Can I put that on a path light to diffuse some of the light? 
or is it only for up lights? Jordan, I'm going to give that one to you. <laughs> um, I so a path light is generally speaking reflective lights. So you're shining a light source up into some sort of reflector. Um, typically, it's the hat of the light. So the light goes up into the hat, and then that's what reflects it back down. So if you install a hex baffle, it's not it's not going to provide some sort of glare shielding. That that light source is typically below the hat, anyways. Uh, I would say that if you're using a directional light or a directional path light, something that's facing down, then yes, you could use a hex baffle to help help tone down the glare with that. Could also okay. add to that that you can also I've also seen people take uh take apart the fixtures and they'll take the reflectors and spray paint them black. Uh, the problem is you're going to hide a lot of glare for changes in elevation, but that will also suck up a lot of the light too. So it, it's kind of a, when when talking about glare and reducing glare, it's a, it's a very fine balance between how much glare you um, you're hiding and how much light is actually going to come out of the fixture. So uh, depending on the needs and the purpose of the path light, like Jordan talked about earlier, where it's where it's going, um, you know, spray painting the inside of it black might might just do it for you. Perfect. Now this question is based on uh, types of fixtures. So do you have a type of fixture that's best for directional light for the proper property line fence? So if you're looking to light up some sort of wall or some sort of physical structure or, or a fence, something like that, I'm typically gonna move to a, a square shaped wash light. So with a round light, as the light leaves it, it has to leave it, it, it can only leave it at the width of the fixture, right? So when we go to a square fixture, what we do is we open up the width that that light can leave. And it's gonna also provide uh, a little bit softer light. So if I'm lighting up something like a wall or, or, or some sort of flat plane, I'm gonna move towards a wash light versus an up light. The only downfall to moving to a wash light is, um, is your viewing angles. So typically speaking, because we want that light to leave that fixture very quickly and very wide, we we don't have a lot of glare shielding on the sides and things like that. So you need to be cognizant of where your viewpoints or where your vantage points are as well when you're using wash lighting. Perfect. Now in this example uh, of the Japanese maple that we showed during the presentation, it was cross lit from both sides and it had a down light inside. What type of downlight do you recommend for getting that moonlight style effect? Pendant, downlight, directional. What are your thoughts, Ryan? So my my preference is is pendants more than anything else. I think they're a little bit easier to install than a directional inside a tree. And 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 because of that, you know, you usually see a decent amount of glare control from a 360 degree um, change as well. So a pendant, either the LE or the VE, would be my recommendation. Okay, so a pendant light is a hanging fixture that might have a loop wire or something that hangs it from it. It's not mounted to anything. It's just normally hanging from something, right? That's correct. Okay. Um, now, oh, I've got a couple comments here about maintenance, and uh, we don't have time to dive too deep into maintenance today, so maybe we have to have another webinar specifically on maintaining the system because you guys alluded to that a little bit during the presentation. So I'm going to make note of that so that we could possibly have a lighting maintenance webinar later on. Um, any tricks to avoid shadows on steps? Tony, you wanna take this one? Shadows on steps, so if you're lighting it up with a um, path light or an under the cap light, I mean, what, what type of light? Because it it really depends on how far the steps, you know, sticking out. If, um, if steps are tough because you think of a step, they're elevated, the land tends to be down below. So you've got, you know, a couple of uh, things going against you. You can't continue up with a uh, a path light if the hill's not climbing with the steps. So you may only be able to do the first step really well, one on each side, and the middle of the staircase. If you're not putting anything under the lip of the actual riser, uh, you may have to go above and put a rail light or an accessory light up on the eave shining down. Uh, shadows are something that's really tough. I mean, I always tell people if you don't like the shadow, add another light. And cross over and kind of wash that out, but you know it's not always easy because finding a position uh, that's kind of situational, I'd say. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think your your best bet on steps, if at all possible, and and Tony said it as well, is to move to a downlight. 
you move to a downlight, something that's mounted well above the stairs, that's when you're going to take away your shadows. Uh, last thing I would add to that too is also is when when working with steps, it helps just to be as consistent as you can. Because remember, steps is all about safety, right? And so the safer you can make the experience, um, the better. And it, it, the more consistent the lighting is, the better as well. So um, it's there's there's a lot of uh, uh, controversy in terms of am I lighting putting the light on the step or am I putting it on the riser? Uh, and what's what's best um, for uh, the viewers or the we'll call it the visitors of a number of different age groups. So in general, from my experience, the the more consistent light, the better. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, this is gonna be the last question because we are already over on time. But can you quickly repeat, Ryan, the foot candle lux difference and desired foot candle per area to illuminate? Yeah, so so in general, the, the difference between between foot candles and lux is it's, it's more of the uh, um, it's just kind of like comparing feet versus meters. So uh, in the North America here, we're we're common to use feet, so foot candles is is the one to use. Um, I I generally look at the the 0.1 foot candle mark. So on a path light, let's say an area light, you have a very round um, um, well, we'll call it photometrics on the ground for measuring your illuminance levels. And so I look at the 0.1 foot candle level. And so really, if it's a com commercial spot, I'll, I'll butt those up together. Uh, in the case that we shared today, it was a, uh, I think, six feet spacing. In um, For residential applications, I take that, that 0.1 foot candle level and I multiply that by three. So in this case, uh, again, that SP picture was, I think, nine feet foot spacing. All right, thank you, Ryan. Gentlemen, I'm gonna have you guys say your last words for this presentation. We are done. There's a few questions that didn't get answered during the live question session. We'll follow up with you uh, as best as we can after the presentation with an email. Uh, Jordan, do you have any last words before we sign off? Uh, thank you guys all for joining us today. I, I appreciate that you wanna you wanna further your knowledge and understanding in lighting. I think it's uh, I think it's such an important part of the landscape and. Oftentimes it's it's one of the first to be removed and and I think that that's uh, that you know if if done properly it, it creates such a such a dramatic effect for the homeowner and 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 could be one of the most important pieces of your landscape. Thanks, Jordan. Tony, you got any last words? Yeah, thanks so much for taking the time out. But honestly, um, you know what? Go for it. This is lighting season. The nights are coming quicker, and you know, let's face it, we've spent quite the six months of people putting money into their house and putting money into their living space. And you know what we have in front of us? We've got holidays coming up, and I think people need some cheer. So it's it's out there. Just go out with the ideas and go in simple, and let the customer tell you what they want, and then call us. We're here to help. Perfect. Thank you, Tony. Ryan. Yeah, just a general thank you for uh, for your support here with the webinar. Thanks for your support in general of, of Hunter and FX Luminaire. We try very hard to to uh, to listen to your needs and to adapt as quickly as we can to make sure that uh, we're making the, the the entire world here full of full of good solid lighting design. All right, thank you, gentlemen. The industry is booming. Work is busy. Everyone's working hard, ladies and gentlemen. The game has changed, the partnership hasn't. We're here to support you every step of the way. If you have any questions, any concerns, please reach out to any one of us or your sales manager in your territory. We're here for you and we appreciate you. We appreciate your business. We want you to stay healthy and stay safe out there. Thanks for joining. Have a great day. Thanks. Thank you.